I make not therefore my head a grave, but a treasure of knowledge. I intend no monopoly, but a community in learning. I study not for my own sake only, but for theirs that study not for themselves. I envy no man that knows more than myself, but pity those that know less. Sir Thomas Brown is a hero. I mean, that's the first thing. I love and adore that man. And if there's anyone in history I'd like to have met, it's him. It's great to have a physician uh, with the Royal College of Physicians who also was so passionate about so many other things. It wasn't just medicine that was driving him. It was something, something much deeper, which fed into all aspects of his life, really. I like the idea that there is nothing foreign to him. There's nothing that he's not willing to entertain as a possibility. What song the sirens sang, or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, though puzzling questions are not beyond all conjecture. Sir Thomas Brown was a medical doctor who was born in the early 17th century and whose life spanned most of it. He had the most uh, erudite medical training that was available in the 17th century, which served him in good stead later on. He traveled widely in his training on the continent as a medical student, came back in his early 30s to England, settled in Norwich uh, to be a provincial doctor for the rest of his life, and to write some of the very best books of the 17th century. Well, Queen Mary University in London are doing a huge study to publish the entire works of Thomas Brown. And they came to us with an idea, really, um, to say, you know, we've, we've got this fantastic knowledge now about Thomas Brown and his, and his literary works. You've got a museum. He was here. You've got lots of collections that belong to him. And so together we've been basically forming an exhibition about Thomas Brown that really focuses on his curiosity because he was a deeply curious man and that's going to be the main thread which is running throughout the whole exhibition. Curiosity is a renaissance word for being interested in lots of stuff. It's a particular kind of intellectual openness which is very typical of this period, and it manifests itself, especially, although not exclusively, in what we now know as curiosity collections, and these take many, many forms. He is a model of how to be. His ability to pursue an idea through all the paths of his own mind, to give his mind a kind of freedom in his notebooks, uh, to engage with the scientific, the uh, religious, the, uh, the natural, the medical, the philosophical, to be kind of deeply penetrated into all aspects of life. I think that is a, an absolute model of existence. You know, he is in no silo. He is a universal man and adorable for that. <laughs> I confess the quality of the subject will sometimes carry us into expressions beyond mere English apprehensions. And indeed, if elegancy still proceedeth, and English pens maintain that stream we have of late observed to flow from many, we shall within a few years be fain to learn Latin to understand English. Thomas Brown's neologisms, his inventions of new words that he needed for his writing, is very remarkable. It's said that after Shakespeare, he is the single most fertile producer of new words in our language. For example, um, ambidextrous, anatomically, capillary, coma, follicle, hallucination, medical, 
extraordinary that that word did not exist in his day, operable, perspire, pubescent, therapeutic, topically, anomalous, circumference, carnal, cynicism, dilution, dissemination, electricity, on which he did a number of experiments, which he wrote about in Pseudodoxia Epidemica, ferocious, locomotion, magnifiable, medallion, migrant, prim, my favorite. He is a great crosser of boundaries in every way, and one of the boundaries he regularly crosses is of uh, sort of Germanic, you know, Anglo-Saxon inheritance and Latinate inheritance. And so, uh, for example, at the end of his great essay, Urn Burial, about de death and uh, memorialization of, of death, he says famously, the iniquity of oblivion blindly scattereth her poppy and deals with the memory of men without distinction to merit of perpetuity. Now, there's an enormous amount of Latin in that, you know, that it's uh, iniquity, oblivion, perpetuity, merit, and so on. But at the heart of that beautiful and famous sentence is the word poppy. You know, he doesn't use anything Latin. And so it has this kind of high Latinate structure with, in the middle of it, again and again, this Anglo-Saxon rooted core. Cyrus the Elder, brought up in woods and mountains when time and power enabled, pursued the dictate of his education and brought the treasures of the field into rule and circumscription, so nobly beautifying the hanging gardens of Babylon that he was also thought to be the author thereof. I was writing a dissertation about the nature of gardens and the 17th century transition between artificiality as the core of beauty and naturalness as the core of beauty. And he wrote a, a famous essay on the gardens of Sarus, which he talks about this dice five uh, pattern, the quincunx. In 1658, he published a work called The Garden of Cyrus, which is a tract really not so much about gardens as about figures of five in the natural world. He's a great plant biologist and uh, plant morphologist, and he's very interested in finding examples of what he calls the quincunx. This is a quincunx. In fact, this is a lot of quincunxes all joined together. But if you take one of these diamond-shaped parallelograms. Notice that there's a dot at each corner, and imagine that there's a central dot in the middle of one of these. That is the quincunx. You, dr you can draw an X through it, or a cross through it, which gives you the five dots of the five-pointed quincunx. And he sees it in uh, the natural world, in orchards and fruits and tree bark and animal skins and so on. He also sees it in the artificial world, for example, um, the, the way the, Greek, the Greeks um, sprung their beds. Uh, they sprung them quincunctually. Nobody knew that till Brown told us. Thomas Brown has been writing this essay about gardens all night, and uh, as he comes to the end of the essay, he talks about his exhaustion in a very Brownian, beautiful way. Though somnus in Homer, somnus meaning sleep, though somnus in Homer be sent to rouse up Agamemnon, I find no such effects in the drowsy approaches of sleep. To keep our eyes open longer were but to act our antipodes. The huntsmen are up in America, and they already pass their first sleep in Persia. But who can be drowsy at that hour which freed us from everlasting sleep, or have slumbering thoughts at that time when sleep itself must end, and, as some conjecture, all shall awake again. The relation of a veroes, and now common in every mouth, of the woman that conceived in a bath by attracting the sperm or seminal effluxion of a man admitted to bathe in some vicinity unto her, I have scarce faith to believe, and, had I been of the jury, 
should have hardly thought I had found the father in the person that stood by her. Tis a new and unseconded way in history to fornicate at a distance, and much offendeth the rules of physic. His kind of great bestseller that went through edition after edition all through the 17th century was a book called Pseudodoxia Epidemica, which means the false learnings of the people. The, the, it's a kind of, it's a great 17th century thing, which is an encyclopedia of wrong ideas. And uh, a wonderful book, full of, uh, full of madness. He's living in a century where there's huge medical advancements, but also a time where there's lots of common myths and legends. And he's debunking these myths and these legends in his writings and really disproving lots of things that people have held for centuries. But yet he's participating in witchcraft trials and things like that. So it's a really interesting juxtaposition. There is a long inherited idea that badgers, for example, had one si uh, legs on one side of their body shorter than the other so that they could run along a hillside and remain, uh, you know, level. Uh, Brown says this isn't true. And, uh, or there's an idea that if you hung a, a kingfisher up, it would always point in the direction of the wind. And he then, of course, classic, uh, sort of 17th century early scientific test, he hung two kingfishers up and they pointed in opposite directions. So clearly that couldn't be true either. And so just a kind of a destruction of the stupidities of the past and an engagement with the, the sort of physical actualities of nature and the world here now. Now for my life, it is a miracle of 30 years which to relate were not a history, but a piece of poetry and would sound to common ears like a fable. For the world, I count it not an inn, but an hospital and a place not to live but to die in. The same year that he writes about the Garden of Cyrus, he also writes, a, a, if anything, even more an astonishing work called Urn Burial. Um, and Urn Burial is, in a way, uh, it, if it were produced today, we would say it was a work of anthropology. What he's doing is uh, making a comparative anthropological study of the ways in which various cultures at various times in the history of mankind have treated their dead. So although it is notionally an anthropological tract, in fact it's leading toward an, a, a very remarkable disquisition on forgetfulness, on the erasure of memory, on the inability to maintain record. And, um, and so Urn Burial is really the great tract on how death destroys our records, how, how oblivion ruins us in memory. Well, I think you can say he is the laureate of death, the laureate of the grave. Uh, that his sense of his own insignificance in the light of the universe and by extension the insignificance of anyone who lives means that there is a giant futility in memorialising our own lives. We are all living in the embrace of forgetfulness. You know, we are the forgotten. And... If that is your conception, you know, that, that beautiful modesty in the face of the universe, then death is actually almost a lovely Keatsian place to be. That he says, this life is not an inn. This world is not an inn, but a hospital, not a place to live in, but to die in. Beside, to preserve the living and make the dead to live, to keep men out of their urns and discourse of humane fragments in them is not impertinent unto our profession, whose study is life and death, who daily behold examples of mortality and of all men least need artificial mementos or coffins by our bedside to remind us of our graves. <laughs> 